Thank you for tuning into the Alt Funds Investment Podcast. This conversation is with Tony Wise. Tony has spent 15 plus years in the legal industry and currently provides legal services in the fund space. We discussed the recent XRP ruling and the implications for digital assets. Just a reminder here, nothing said in this video is legal, tax, or investment advice. We hope you enjoy this interview. Please like and subscribe if you find this information helpful. And check out the links in the description to connect with us and Tony. Why did the SEC sue XRP to begin with? Yeah, so the SEC sued um, Ripple, the company, um, to begin with because they were saying that the uh, token itself is a security. And then the way that the token was sold and distributed was a security. And because the token itself was a security, XRP, and the uh, methods in which the token was distributed were also securities offerings, um, they needed to have a corresponding uh, registration statement with, um, uh, with the SEC. Basically, they needed to be registered offerings, uh, which they were not. And therefore, um, they violated the Securities Act because they were doing this, um, or Ripple was doing this in interstate commerce. That sort of ties it all together and brings it under the SEC's jurisdiction. Um, and so they needed to have that statement on on file, um, but, it, but it was not. I guess where, where are we at today? I guess that XRP is not a security. I think that's a, the, a very interesting part of it. Um, the uh, court in this case has ruled um, on its summary uh, on the on the summary judgment motion that certain sales uh, were not securities offerings, while other sales uh, were securities offerings, and thus needed the registration statement. Um, but I think very importantly ruled that XRP itself is not a security because it didn't uh, meet the Howey test, which is a test promulgated by the Supreme Court to determine whether uh, an investment contract is in place. So essentially whether there's been a contract investment um, or a scheme that amounts to an investment contract and therefore that thing, in this case, XRP, whether that's a security or not. So they had an analysis on the token itself. I thought that was a, a rather light analysis and perhaps subject to um, attack on appeal. Perhaps that could be vulnerable. That's the point where people are taking this uh, this order and saying that all digital assets or all tokens are not securities. I think that's the part that we have to be careful about because my reading is that you need to apply Howey to essentially each leg of this transaction. Essentially, the Howey test um, uh, requires that you meet three or four uh, prongs of the test. It's an investment of money into a common enterprise with the expectation of profit um, based, or I should say derived solely from the efforts of others. Um, so, you know, three prongs or, or four prongs, some, sometimes the uh, third and the fourth are combined into one, but based, or, or excuse me, um, an expectation of profit based solely on the efforts of others. Uh, so in XRP um, or in the Ripple case, I, I, I should say, that test was applied to the token itself. It was applied to institutional sales of XRP, uh, to um, programmatic sales of XRP, and then also to other distributions and sales of XRP, like employee grants and whatnot. What's a, what's a programmatic sale? So a programmatic sale, um, as uh, detailed by the court, were blind bid ask transactions, essentially sales of Ripple or XRP from Ripple uh, on exchanges. Um, so they were done algorithmically um, and just basically put up for sale. The buyer did not know who was selling them the token and the seller didn't know who was buying. So there was really no um, expectation from one party or the other. 
um, as to uh, how Ripple or XRP was going to perform. Uh, so very importantly, the buyers didn't know that they were investing money into Ripple itself via purchase of XRP. Um, and therefore the buyer had no expectation that this token was going to appreciate very importantly, again, based on the efforts of Ripple itself. Some people could have been purchasing uh, XRP via these programmatic sales, but know nothing of Ripple itself. And this was stated directly in the order. Um, you could have just been in, into crypto at the time and were buying a broad basket of crypto assets because you thought they all were going to appreciate. Yeah, that, that's that's very interesting just thinking about that the, the larger impacts across the space right tony meaning that any exchange that I, i'm curious to get your thoughts basically um in that case given the programmatic sales point if any uh future um xrp is, is sold on exchanges bought and sold um or any exchange does that set a precedent then for you know none of that's is considered a security right or is that kind of the idea yeah, I think it's still nuanced. Um, essentially, in this case, because uh, again, pro when analyzing the programmatic sales, they were done in such a manner that it was very algorithmic and nobody knew who was um, on either side of the transaction. So that's very important. That's why that actual transaction itself didn't meet the Howey test. Uh, um, because they didn't satisfy that fourth prong of derived solely from the efforts of other others. And they read it really strictly. Like you had to, as a buyer, you had to understand that you were investing uh, money into Ripple and expect that there would be uh, a profit based on Ripple uh, building out the network. Um, so I think for other uh, specific tokens that are in similar shoes, that would still be the case. Um, the question as to whether um, secondary trading itself falls under the securities rules is actually kind of a different analysis. That was not um, ruled on by the court here because it was not before the court. I think um, in foot, I believe it was uh, footnote 16 of the order the judge specifically said that secondary sales are not being analyzed and not being ruled on here. Um, but again, importantly, because digital tokens themselves are not in and of themselves securities, that's, that's what the win is here um, for the industry. So just having a digital token and selling that on the exchange, um, that behavior in and of itself is not going to be considered a securities transaction. However, I think this is where either on appeal or later on down the line or in another case, um, the SEC could get a little bit um, creative here and start applying Howie to specific tokens themselves. And I think they've tried to do that in Coinbase and some of the other actions, um, but they're gonna get, need to get really specific on their allegations and uh, really prove that you're meeting all four prongs of uh, of the Howey test. So for something like Ripple, which you know essentially is um, uh, what the court found to be more of you know a commodity or um, a currency, you know, form of payment, that sort of uh, fails the Howey test because there's no direct expectation of profit derived from the efforts of others. There could be another digital token um, where investors are investing money um, and then that token grants the investor some sort of passive income stream that is based on the efforts of others. And I think in that case, um, you're way more likely to have it uh, be found to be a security. And then that secondary trading of that asset um, would also be subject to uh, uh, securities rules. That makes a lot of sense. Like if if a protocol was charging fees and the holder of the token got the fees, for example. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that's uh, a differentiated case from from the Ripple case. And again, this is 
new technology that we're analyzing with really old securities rules and we're trying to in some cases put you know a square peg in a round hole um i think the court in uh the ripple case so far has done a pretty good job i know I've, I've mentioned there's some places of perhaps weaknesses that could be attacked on appeal um but they're kind of doing the best that they can with the tools that they have um but this is where we're going to need more legislation and i think to the point where not all tokens are or i should say tokens themselves um just as they stand being um you know essentially digital tokens or uh, smart contracts and things of that nature that does not make it a security in and of itself so the question is do we want to keep going back to the old rules or should we you know, promulgate some leg legislation here that makes sense uh, for this new technology that, you know, frankly, uh, obviously didn't exist uh, a century ago. Yeah, some type of harmonization across across both sides of the equation, if you will. Um, what are your thoughts then, Tony, I guess, with obviously with this kind of this ruling at this point, we assume it's going to be appealed, right? Um, I don't know how long, maybe it'll take a year or so for that to go through potentially. Um, and how does that help or hurt Coinbase and Binance, the other kind of um, cases out there from an exchange perspective, just to get your thoughts there on that? Yeah. So on the appeal process, uh, I'm not an expert there. I think they, um, both parties actually have some time to decide whether they want to appeal or not. Um, I can't remember exactly what the appeal deadline is. Um, but there are reasons uh, why they would want to appeal or not appeal. Um, I think uh, from Ripple's perspective, they pretty much won everything except for the institutional sales. Um, they're going to have to consider whether it makes sense to, to, to try to fight that. Um, we didn't really discuss in, institutional sales specifically, but essentially that was um, sales to institutional investors who knew that they were going to be um, investing into Ripple. Ripple would be using those funds to build, build out the network. And therefore, the institutional investors had this expectation of profit. Um, so that did satisfy the Howey test. Um, interestingly, and I'm not sure if it made it through in the order on the facts. I, I didn't really see it or in prior prior uh, pleadings, but, you know, the next question is whether those institutional sales transactions were actually private placements. So even though they were securities, perhaps there was an exemption available for those transactions. So I think that's something that's pretty, pretty interesting. Um, so it's kind of like, you almost, that? almost like, you... yeah, it's almost like a, a, a no harm, no foul um, type of analysis. And I think that's a really important point a lot of people have made that the order at the end of the day, in some ways, protects the institutional investors um, even more because what they're saying is those institutional sales were securities offerings and therefore we needed to have a registration statement with all the appropriate disclosures. Um, but we all know at the end of the day, these institutional investors that were getting a first look already know what the risks are. So they really don't need to be protected in the same way that a retail investor um, uh, theoretically needs to be protected under the existing laws. Um, so that was a very important, uh, I think, outcome here, because at the end of the day, the retail investors that bought XRP through the programmatic sales, um, they didn't get the benefit of the registration statements, but Apparently, there was no need because those were not securities offerings. Uh, so there is a bit of tension in the outcome of the ruling on those two sort of, uh, you know, polarized points, you know, being at different ends of the spectrum. And I do think that the if there is an appeal, it could give an appellate court sort of a second bite at the apple here as far as we need to make an outcome that makes sense from a retail um, investor perspective. And that's where I think there could be some weakness. 
Um, again, I think I mentioned that the analysis on XRP itself being a security or, or not uh, was relatively light. I think it was really handled in just a couple sentences, uh, which makes sense to some degree. But leading up to it, the judge, um, Judge Tor Torres, actually said that the defendants, aka Ripple, were missing the point on that, meaning that um, just because XRP itself was a digital token didn't mean it couldn't be a security. It had to be analyzed in its different offerings and distributions. But then they turned around and very quickly said that it was not a security. Uh, so I do think that there's leeway for an appellate, appellate court to sort of pull on some threads and emphasize certain facts over others, which appellate courts uh, can do and come to a different uh, conclusion. That makes sense. And I guess going back, Tony, to what you said about the Howey test, that's that's a three or four prong test. That's a basically pass fail. You get to apply all those prongs. It's either all have to, to apply or none, right? Is that correct? Yep, that's that's that is correct. It has to be um, satisfied in all aspects for it to be security. Right. Okay. It's yeah. It's really interesting thinking about like Ripple and thinking about like Bitcoin and Ethereum, where they're I mean they're really just like networks. Like there's really, you know, besides exchanging XRP, there's really no other use case that I'm aware of. Versus when you compare that to like an equity, you know. Yeah. So with an equity or stock you as the investor do get certain shareholder rights <laughs> with bitcoin and ethereum you own a part of the network um but it's not equity in a company there's no board of directors it's a com some people try to equate them but i think a more nuanced view is to look at the differences and there are differences um and that's where you have to really at least from 1933 through whenever the Howey uh, ruling was made, applied these old securities rules. And they just don't really seem to uh, hold up with this new technology. So um, I know that there's um, a bipartisan uh, bill that uh, hopefully people will look at and support and hopefully that will make some sort of more common sense analysis as to how we view these assets and whether they in some cases are securities and other cases uh, are, are definitely not securities. Do you have any thoughts on governance tokens? Um, yeah. So whether they are themselves uh, securities or... Yeah, do you think it would kind of fall into the same bucket as XRP where I mean, take something like Uniswap, like the token is a governance token, but there's no, you're not an owner of the company. Tech, or are you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm more familiar with cases like um, UkiDAO, which was um, a complaint from the CFTC against uh, essentially a DAO, UkiDAO. And in that case, the CFTC was alleging that the DAO um, was providing a essentially an exchange for derivatives contracts on commodities. So all of that activity um, in the in the pools was CFTC regulated regulated behavior, and the DAO itself needed to um, register as an exchange in a, a futures commission merchant. Just going forward with 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 UkiDAO, the token holders themselves do have a measure of liability with respect to the exchange, aka the DAO not registering as a, a futures exchange. And but what was interesting was the way that the CFTC actually got to that conclusion was because in the Commodities and Exchange Act, there's a specific section that allows you to um, go after principles of an entity um, personally and to go through the corporate veil. So that was basically what was done in UkiDAO to go after the founders, um, but also the token holders themselves uh, still had a measure of liability. So that's in 
sort of commodities in CFTC land. Uh, but I think you could potentially make similar arguments in the securities realm as well. So as far as governance tokens are concerned, just, I guess, to repeat, it's, um, I think it's, it, it, it's always going to be a facts and circumstances analysis and you have to take it on a case by case basis. But I think there's always going to be more factors, um, that lead you closer to whether that specific asset is a token versus something like ripple. That makes sense. I guess going back Tony, to the, you're talking about, you know, secondary trading was not before the court originally, right. As, as a topic of conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, so how does that impact the future of trading of XRP? Is it still on a case by case basis? I know the token is considered not a, not a security, correct? Based on the right. analysis here. Well, that, does that still you know, change, you know, future activities from a trading perspective with regards to XRP so to security laws or what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it already has changed how that token is, is treated. I believe um, Coinbase has relisted it or is in the process of putting it back on the exchange to trade. Um, I think other exchanges have done similar things as well. They're, they're bringing it back. Um, so yeah, I think it's going to open up even more trading activity in that specific to token and in other tokens that are sort of similar, similarly situated. I think exchanges are going to feel, feel a lot more comfortable uh, listing tokens that um, really operate in the same way as uh, as XRP. So I see it as being something that's going to be, uh, it's very positive, obviously, for the industry and for the players, uh, traders, exchange, uh, exchanges, um, you know, other people in that boat. But like like I said, I, I don't. I still think it's going to be on a case by case analysis. So I think we're all feeling pretty good about XRP. But right. um, you know, let's see what happens with some of these other tokens. Yeah, that's interesting. So basically, this obviously sets a precedent for for XRP in itself. But there's still going to be analysis on a case by case basis for each token. Uh, what are your thoughts on just broader implications of how cryptocurrencies are classified and regulated with this case, and then obviously how it you know, kind of trickles downstream, if you will, just in your opinion. Yeah, well, I think for now, the outcome is that the, the, the celebrated outcome is that digital tokens are not in and of themselves securities. Um, so again, I, I still think it's case by case, but as of now, I think the exchanges are going to feel a lot more comfortable to list all sorts of different tokens until sort of proven otherwise. Um, you know, very, very clearly, Judge Torres says that digital tokens are not securities. I think that kind of gives the exchanges uh, a measure of comfort and a little bit of um, <laughs> some slack uh, to to list uh, tokens more freely. I would be a little careful, uh, you know, personally, I'd be a little careful um, sort of determining what I'm going to list on an exchange because you don't want to just list everything under the sun because then you are essentially opening yourself up um, to attack uh, because you've listed things that then are securities or later found to be securities. Uh, but again, I think that we're eventually going to need to sort of all come together and have um, a piece of legislation on cryptocurrency and digital assets that makes sense. Uh, that way, um, you know, everyone is comfortable knowing what is a security and then that needs to go into a regulated exchange and then what is not a security and what can be traded on uh, crypto exchanges. Whether those themselves need to be regulated on, under some sort of other legislation, um, I think is a, is a question to be asked and probably answered in the affirmative, but um, Again, we're we're applying old laws, so we'll need to sort of iron that out as we go forward. Yeah, and you you brought up a, a very important point. I think I just highlighted an interesting point at, at the very least about um, the retail investor element, right? And the different points that got brought up in the case. Uh, you know, as we go forward, what measures should both cryptocurrency companies and regulators take to strike a balance between investor protection 
and fostering innovation within the crypto industry. We're talking about this is kind of a unique nuance, right? When you talk about institutional versus programmatic trading, which does affect retail investors, to your point, and how do mm -hmm. we best, you know, mitigate challenges there when, when, it's, when we're speaking to retail investors? That's an interesting point you brought up as well. Yeah, uh, the outcome of the of the order, and I don't, I don't know, I don't think that this was intended by the court, but the institutional investors in some way are being a little bit uh, protected more than the retail investors. Of course, there was institutional investors purchasing XRP through the programmatic sales. Um, so I don't know if you sort of balance it all out, like, like, you know, how much of, of those programmatic sales were just retail? Like if it was a lot of institutional investors that were purchasing via the programmatic, then at the end of the day, retail investors were not um, uh, damaged in any way because they didn't get registration statements. However, you know, that was, I believe back in 2017, 2018 time period, there's more people who know about crypto these days. And so there is an argument that there's a lot more retail out there um, that uh, needs the benefit of regulator, regulator uh, protection. I guess that sort of depends on, on who you ask uh, because then you get into the, what are the actual accredited investor rules and do they make sense? I know they were updated a few years ago to, um, essentially bring other people into the definition. So people that took the series seven or registered with FINRA um, or are in other ways knowledgeable in financial investments. Um, but again, I do think the court for the most part applied Howie correctly and, and pretty strictly across the different types of sales and came to what are logical conclusions based on what the tools that they were given. And again, I think that's why it opens it up for more comprehensive, logical legislation. Right. Uh, you, I guess across the three different offerings that you mentioned, the, the institutional programmatic and then the other, the on the other side, what, what was that, what did that entail? What was the specifics around that offering? The, so the yeah the other sales and distributions were essentially token grants to XRP employees and other service providers as payment for service. Um, there are some that think the analysis on that prong, uh, although favorable to Ripple, think that the analysis was actually pretty light and weak because you can find consideration for the investment contract. Um, in right. other ways, other than an investment in money. Um, so we will see if that is a point that the SEC ends up appealing. Yeah, that's, that's I, interesting. Yeah, I think that's going to be interesting to see. I do think that I put my gut feel for Howie is that it should be very strictly applied in that it is an investment of money. Otherwise, I feel like even though it's a contract, is it really an investment contract, which is at the end of the day, the, the um, sort of the, the transaction or scheme or artifice that you're trying to meet. Um, and so I'm not sure that the SEC would actually win, but the analysis was a little bit light there and perhaps uh, a place that the SEC can try to pull on a thread. Yeah, very interesting. I guess just from your view at this point, just curious your your feedback from from client or other folks in the industry that you speak with. Um, what are the, what's their initial reaction, um, and, and what, where do you kind of go from here as you advise other firms in the space, or maybe in a similar situation as they kind of bring, you know, new funds to light or, or to launch, and, and and as they go through this, what what's the thoughts around that? Yeah, so. I've had some discussions with uh, some clients and other people in the industry. I think the general feeling is that this is obviously a really good outcome, but it's not sort of um, you get free free reign at this point. 
Um, again, it, it's a, I, I do think on a token level, it's a case by case basis. Um, I do think as um, a fund manager, and those are the type of clients that I typically represent, you still have to be very uh, aware of the securities rules, both federally and in your state, sort of, you know, where you're transacting business, where you're operating from, because it only takes one token to be deemed a security for then all the securities laws to apply to you. Um, so if you're only trading Ripple at this point or XRP, I would feel pretty comfortable uh, notwithstanding the appeal. But if you're trading a lot of different assets, then can you be certain that all those other assets are not securities? Um, so that's the question. And because it's probably not reasonable for you to be able to answer that a hundred percent certainly, then you're still going to need to pay attention and abide by uh, and comply with all the relevant securities laws. Um, what, what would be the what would be the effects if they were securities and somebody was trading them? What what would change for that individual or, or fund? Yeah, but essentially, if if you're a fund manager, you would need to be registered as an investment advisor with the appropriate regulator, whether that's the SEC or the state, um, or a veil of an exemption. So, if you're a private fund manager, there are a couple of exemptions typically available to you where you do not have to register as an investment advisor. And then all the investment advisors, um, not not all the rules, but most of the applicable and more burdensome rules applicable to investment advisors don't apply. Yeah, no, that, that's helpful. I think I'm glad you answered that Tony, because I think, you know, we've talked to a lot of folks in the industry, right? And they see this case and they see the, the result. And then as you go through, if they're going to launch a new fund, they take that as well. This is not a security then. And that way we're going to go that route as to all or nothing versus, well, this this is still taken on a case by case basis. And we probably should err on the, the side of caution. When we're creating our, you know, our uh, PPM and offering memorandum and all that, right? Yeah, absolutely. That's actually the position our firm has always uh, uh, taken since day one, since we started launching cryptocurrency hedge funds was to you know, in the worst case, let's just assume these are all securities. And if you do so, the cost of compliance is actually rather low, especially when you're first launching. Um, you don't have to register with the SEC as a uh, private fund manager until your assets under man management exceed 150 million. So that gives you a pretty good um, amount of run runway to scale your business while keeping your compliance costs and compliance obligations relatively low. Uh, it's really not that high of a hurdle um, to make that assumption that everything is a security and then comply. If you do so, you have almost no regulatory risks. And I think that's important to keep in mind, even after um, this ruling, this order, from the SEC's perspective, and it's just, you know, your opinion, of course, but, you know, the, the current stance is regulation through enforcement. Do you think with this case, uh, you know, damn things going forward, is that kind of maybe change a bit as to more, more conversation and discussion versus just uh, enforcement as it's been at this point? Or what are your thoughts there? Yeah, I've heard it sort of both ways, whether the regulators are going to take a step back or whether they'll just keep doing the same old thing. I honestly don't, I, I honestly don't know there. I think it would be foolish to continue. I personally think it'd be foolish to continue reg, uh, regulation through enforcement. It doesn't make any sense. Um, I think the SEC was expecting a much different outcome in um, this Ripple case so far. And through all the uh, pleadings to date, it really seems like from day one, Ripple was winning the fight. I don't think they've won the war uh, the, the war yet, but they've been, you know, winning a battle here and there. And I don't think the SEC was expecting that at all. I think this only bolsters Coinbase and Binance's defenses against the SEC. So I think it would be foolish for them to keep doing doing the same thing. 
And I think everyone realizes that we do need to have some sort of comprehensive le legislation that makes sense so that we can foster this technology, allow the United States to take advantage of it and to profit from, from it and, you know, provide industry for, for people looking to get into it. Um, all while at the same time protecting uh, investors. So I think that's the goal that we need to all sort of strive to achieve. Yeah, well said. Absolutely. Totally agree. Yeah, definitely, you know, great innovation and keep the, you know, opportunities here in the U.S. that, that you know, with this uncertainty, it definitely gives people a bad taste in their mouth and they look elsewhere, right? Hopefully we can, can change that a bit going forward. Absolutely. We've had clients across our firm, um, you know, that we've seen try to establish presence outside the United States simply because they didn't think that there was a friendly regulatory regime. I think that's actually true in a lot of cases. Um, going back to my um, thoughts on private fund managers, I actually think for a private fund manager, you're okay in the United States because we do know how to comply with the current rules. Um, but I agree, it's harder for exchanges and money transmitters and other types of service providers to operate within the current uh, regime. So it so it does kind of it does kind of um, depend there. And I don't think it makes any sense to um, push all this offshore. Um, you know, we're supposed to be a hub of innovation, just like other places. So we should embrace it. Yeah, it's great insight. Absolutely. Yeah. Hopefully, this is a a good step in the right direction, and uh, you know, hopefully, we continue to see positive changes and in, in you know that are beneficial to the environment and that beneficial to everybody in this within the space. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, Tony, this has been amazing. Really appreciate your insights. Where can people go to connect with you and uh, get in touch? Uh, yeah. Um, people can find me on um, the firm's website, colefreeman.com. Um, you can find me as, uh, as a um, partner on the team page, I believe. Um, I also have a LinkedIn and Twitter. I do not remember my Twitter handle off the top of my head. It's actually relatively new, but I believe it's at Tony underscore wise, which is my last name underscore. So at Tony underscore wise underscore, um, I believe is my uh, Twitter handle. I should be easy enough to find. And I'm also on LinkedIn. If you look me up, Tony wise, um, Cole Freeman and Mellon, you're sure enough to find me there. And I do um, post and also, sh you know, short articles on LinkedIn um, as well that uh, not always crypto related, but almost always private fund and hedge fund related. And again, that's the world that, um, that I play in, but um, it's almost always tangential to crypto. So a lot of crypto insights as well. That's awesome. We'll make sure to include those, the contact info in the show notes. That's awesome, Tony. We hope you enjoyed this conversation. If you're still watching, please make sure to like and subscribe for more content like this. Reach out if you're interested in starting a fund, whether it's hedge fund, VC fund, whatever it is, and let us know if there's any other topics you'd like to cover. Thank you.